Yeah, yeah, that is awesome. Uh, Children's Church, you guys can make your way over here. Those that, um, that's a four-year-old uh, fourth grade. And so that's through here. If you're, uh, if you're wanting to do that, if you want to keep your child in with you, that's okay too. Um, we're in uh, Joshua 22, and this is, quite a, uh, this is quite a story going on here. And it's, uh, I think it's going to be a fun one f- for us. We moved here after 30 years in, uh, in Arizona, 20 years in Phoenix and 10 years up by Sedona. And I'll tell you, if there are two states that are different, I think we found them. Arizona and Pennsylvania are, uh, are pretty different, and we're often asked what the differences are. Uh, and there's just a lot. Um, I'll tell you, sports-wise, here's one, is that very few people in Arizona, their number one favorite NFL team is usually not the Arizona Cardinals. It's wherever they're from. You want to see a large group of Pittsburgh Steeler fans? If Steelers play Cardinals at home, the entire place is black and yellow. I mean, it's, it's, they come out of the woodwork, which is where they usually are. In, no, no, good work. High quality woodwork. <laughs> Super good high quality. I took Grant to a Raiders, uh, Raiders Cardinals game, and it was it was the most dangerous place in town. It was just black and gray everywhere. So sports teams are different there. Uh, different, you know. We don't have tornadoes. You don't have them here either, though. Uh, we had scorpions, a lot of them. Um, I've been stung in bed several times. That's a way to wake up. You want to wake up a startled in the middle of the night, and you know it when it happens. And you throw the sheets back, and there it is, staring at you. Uh, they're different. But I'll tell you, one thing you catch on is they're not comparable. They're, they're beautiful. Arizona is a beautiful, beautiful state. Pennsylvania, honestly, it's just gorgeous. The trees, the mountains, obviously the people. I think we've come to really appreciate West Virginia. Talk about beautiful. Maryland. You look at the uniqueness, a lot of differences. Today's topic is a similarity. Today's topic is a similarity in people no matter where we are and not just geographically, um, 2,000 years ago, same, 1,000 years ago. It doesn't matter where you are. Today's topic is so timeless. And we have to think in our minds today about your family because this topic fits in your family really well. In your work environment, and at school, and obviously in church as well. So let me pray, and we'll just kind of walk through, I think, a hopefully a timely message for a lot of us. Heavenly Father, we're committing this passage to you. I pray that we understand it and apply it, have some fun with it, and yet conform to it through your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The passage is in Joshua 22. And you have the feel for this thing. All the land has been distributed with Israel. And this is the founding of the land of Israel. But as you look at a map, there are some tribes on the east side of the Jordan River, which is today the country of Jordan. So as they crossed the Jordan River to conquer the land, there were a couple tribes that already had their land. But the deal was, you know, you still fight with us just because you're already taken care of. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're all in. And so they fought everything. They fought. And then now we're dust is settling, and the tribes are all finding their peace, and they're finding their land. And take a look in verse 10, actually, of Joshua 22. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, that is, the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, that little phrase is going to show up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. 
If you don't know what tribes those are, it's we're not paying any attention. There's two and a half tribes. Remember why there's a half tribe? It's the 12 tribes for the 12 sons, but Joseph, his was divided with two kids. So half tribe, half tribe. So here they are, the people of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. Okay, so you have right there on the Jordan River. No one really knows what side of the river. They're thinking it's the east side based on phrasing. Could have been on the west side. Imposing a spectacular altar is built by these two and a half tribes. Kind of raises some suspicion. And the people of Israel heard it said, Behold, the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan, the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh. Shiloh was kind of the acting capital. Jerusalem isn't yet. So Shiloh is that city. It's not far from Jericho, and actually no one really knows exactly where that was. But they gathered at Shiloh to make war against those two and a half tribes. Then the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, uh, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, with him ten chiefs, one from each of the tribe families, every one of them the head of the family among the clans, and they came to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, and this is what they said. Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. What is this breach of faith that you've committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against, um, against the Lord? This was... This was a disaster. They built this altar. Turns out, they built it to honor the fact that we're all unified. They actually built this altar so that their kids and their kids and their kids will always remember just because we're on the Transjordan side doesn't mean that we're a part of the group. And yet it was 100% interpreted the other way. So in your notes, take a look at how all of this started. It's the first point. It's the we heard it said. This is it. Verse 11, and the people of Israel heard it said, behold, the people of Reuben, Gad, half-tribe, have built the altar in the frontier in the region the side that belongs to Israel, and the people heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. We heard it said. All of this is from somebody, we don't even know who they are. It literally is the gossip issue. They heard it said. In fact, it went from we heard it said to Verse 12, and when the people of Israel heard it, the whole assembly of people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to rage war. This is unbelievable. Because we heard it said. They said. The infamous they. We take complaints. We take concerns. They said. And we pass it along. From a church, a club, an association, boards, committees, families. I think stakes are really high in the church business. We heard it said. Someone said. Here's another one. Many of us think, isn't that a great one? Many of us, like, is there a, is there a mouse in your pocket? Like, who's, this happens from a sporting team all the way up to the largest. It's they said. And it's either to build the courage to say something and they didn't want to claim it. It's to pass on an untruth. We don't, who knows? I heard it on NPR this week. I am actually an NPR junkie. I know. 
It, it doesn't make sense. Being conservative, that I would enjoy the stories and the car talk back in the day, if that means anything to you. Um, I like NPR, classic on Friday. Friday, they're still trying to figure out what happened with the election. And they said um, that now the White House is going to be full of billionaires because we can name two, okay, Elon Musk and, uh, and the president. And this is what the guy said on air, national to international. He goes, well, you know, I've talked to some historians, and they've told us that, and then he made a stupid remark. Do you see how he built it? Oh, I've talked to historians. You can't disagree with that. I've talked to historians, and that gives you the freedom to say dumb things, apparently. <laughs> right? I mean, but that's, it's the, I heard it said. That's what's going on there. I heard it said. And likely being used, they're propping us up to say something at work that nobody else would say. So if they could get you riled, you go in and say, it's not me, but people have been talking. It's literally what happened here. And they got riled. They got so riled. Could you imagine? You had to go now to every tribe to get representatives. This isn't like a one-day problem or a week long. This took a while. They gathered everybody together to rage war. And look at what some of the accusations were. I circled them all. Um, thus says the whole congregation, it's a breach of faith. Israel is turning away building an altar, they're thinking a replacement of the altar in Shiloh, later to be in Jerusalem, rebellion, verse 18, rebel, and then rebels, and rebel is used again in verse 19. They got a lot of detail quick. The accusations were outrageous because we heard it said this is the definition of uh, gossip. I used to think gossip are saying things that are untrue. That's, that's, not, that's not true. Gossip is conversation that's often light and informal and usually about other people's business. It's the wrong people talking. We talk about things that are about our business and it involves somebody else, that's who we go to. So I wrote, I wrote this. We all agree that this talk, that we need to be careful not to have talkers manipulate us. But I have to stop and realize that I'm hypocritical to not say that I'm one of them. I have to be careful. We have to be careful. You and I, who maybe unwisely lack a filter of ideas about somebody, about something that is out of line of what, of what we have business in. This is the great thing about this topic, though. Could you use something great about it? <laughs> is this is a good time to talk about it because it's not going on. We have boards at the church. Everyone has boards and committees that are healthy. This is a disaster passage to show up when the problem is rampant. This is not the time because no one could look each other in the eyes, right? We're like, oh, he's talking about me. No, I'm not talking about anybody but me. That's, that's literally the only one I have in mind. But families should think about this. I remember early on with the kids, when our kids were smaller, when there was a problem, they always came to us. Then I noticed, the youngest now is 22, I noticed when there's a problem, they go to each other, and they leave us out. And I used to tell them that. We used to say, come and say, this is what's going on. And I go, you know, there's a day in which you're not going to go to me at all. I'm going to be the problem. And you're going to talk among kids. 
And they're like, oh, dad, that'll never happen. Oh, that is so happened. That is so happened. Good. They need to compare notes and, you know, they always need to get together and decide what wonderful gifts to get me or whatever they talk about. That's a good idea. But in families, siblings, they're talking about the other sibling. No, no, go to that sibling and talk. What they won't listen. Well, it doesn't mean then you go to this one. That's, That's not where it goes. It goes to the one with the issue. Have we not, are we not the funniest people that we, well, but we're going to pray about it. Is that a greatest line? Let me share this with you as a prayer request. You get a godly voice in it. Just need advice. Yeah, if that really is the motive, yeah, okay. I think very often maybe it's not. Verse 12 again. And when the people of Israel heard of it, and the heard of it is back up, the people of Israel heard it said, and now everyone heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. This is quite remarkable. Somebody to stop and just say, well, let's think this through. There could be another explanation. I used to think that accusations politically, that there's some truth in what's being said, until I realized very often there's no truth at all. Right? I mean, we're, we find, because we happen to know, or we happen to be on a site, we're like, that's not even, that's not even close to being true. That's what was happening here with war. They literally were building an altar, an impressive altar, not for sacrificing, as a monument to the unity between the two and a half tribes and the rest. And it was interpreted as divisive against the other tribes. It's remarkable. And I think often, not in a demeaning way, but we could probably use some grace in stopping people. Hey, uh, no, you know what? I'm not in on that. That's not mine. Because you and I know that when we listen at work, at school, at church, in families, and we don't say anything, it takes it as you're in agreement. Am I right? They will walk away. Oh, yeah, we talked about it. That's what they're going to say about your conversation that you didn't say anything. Oh, yeah, we, well, we, we talked about it. No, you talked about it, and the other wasn't able to say anything. Coming out of church, there's a story of this gal who said to her husband, classic as they're walking out, do you think that Johnson girl is tinting her hair? And the husband says, I I didn't even see her. And the lady then says, well, but what about Mrs. Davis, what she's wearing? Don't tell me that that's what an outfit should be of a mother of two. And the guy goes, I'm really afraid I didn't didn't notice that either. And then finally the woman said, for heaven's sake, a lot of good you are going to church. Like, you're missing everything. You're missing all the exciting pieces. My brother was a dean of students at Arizona Christian University for a season, and a student leader went into the president's office and said, "Um, I kind of have something I want to talk to you about, a problem with um, Randy, dean dean of men, and the president, the coolest, he's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And he stood up. And the kid's like, yeah, what? He goes, come on, let's go. And the kid's like, yeah, okay. And they walked out of the office. The kid says, so where are we going? Go and talk to Randy. Walked down the hallway, tapped on the door. Hey, Randy. Yes, President Garrison, what can I do for you? He goes, hey, uh, Chris here has something to chat with you about and walked away. 
Is that awesome? And he didn't do it to be mean. He just literally did it like, why would I get involved in something and I have nothing to do with it? That was a great example. There are those talkers, which we're all guilty of at different times. But the problem are the listeners that feed it by listening. Verse 16. Verse 15, and they came to people of Reuben, people of Gad, half tribe in the land of Gilead. Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. What is this breach? And it goes from 16 through so much of the chapter with constant accusation. Constant. When should have just gotten the whole story. Haven't we all been there? I'm like, there is no good explanation for this at all. None. I'm just going to ask, though, and I find a great explanation. I'm like, oh, okay, that does make sense. Oh, maybe I shouldn't be involved in this. Might be one of the biggest keys to defeating distrust is that we have the willingness to hear out a whole story and talk. What do they say in marriage? One of the greatest tools in marriage, communication. Just get talking. Just get talking. One of the greatest ways to eliminate distrust or disagreement is to talk. As a family, at work, just talk. Just say it. And say, I'm not taking it to anybody else, but I'm taking it to you because I just I want to hear what's going on with this. And then you leave it there. How much we all would appreciate that kind of a spirit, that kind of an approach. Imagine the history if that had followed through. If this two and a half tribes was not able to convince them that absolutely nothing you said was true. Well, it's partially, nope, it's not even close to being true. It's actually the opposite, and now that you've come to us with this much anger, I'm actually thinking maybe we should do what you're suggesting, because now we're so angry. And of course they didn't. It's remarkable. In an effort to show unity, in Mark a level of inclusion with all of the tribes, remarkable. In an effort for that, a civil war just about broke out. Take a look at our last slide. As we kind of think through and kind of wrapping up just a little bit here, it's a commitment of our speech for the purpose of God's glory, peace, and for the good of others. Sounds churchy, but think about your sports team. Think about work and at school. It's broader. It's, it's not a problem here. It always is because we're all people, right? There's always elements of it, and it's not them. It's us. It's me. But think about your other environments, your club, committing at least yourself to a speech for the purpose of God's glory, peace, and for the good of others. I just read this week uh, a, a cool little, the word think, when someone tells you something or draws you in, the acrostic think, and ask, is it true? That's the T. The H and think, is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? If not, maybe stop it. Maybe let it go. So there were four preachers, and they were gathered kind of privately, and they said, you know, we're hearing people confess stuff all the time. Let's be each other's confession. And they're like, great idea. I love this. 
And so the first guy says, uh, he goes, yeah, you know what? I, I just got a thing about, I'm watching movies. I'm just wasting my time. I watch movies. I love movies. I'm watching them all the time. And the guys go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, gotcha. The second one says, uh, you know what? I just, nothing like a cigar behind the parsonage. You'll catch me back there. And the others go, oh, okay. The third one, man, do I like poker. I'm playing poker. I sneak down the street, and I'm playing it all the time. Get to the fourth one, and the fourth one goes, eh, gossip. I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what... I, there's no control over every, everybody at work. They're, you can't. They only have the same value base that you have at work in a school, in your sports team. There is, let go of that. Let go of forcing this onto somebody else. Church, family, can't control it. How hypocritical to try to anyway, to try to tell them that they're wrong. No, 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 no. Take a step back, all of us, and we go, I know who I can control. I can control me. I want to be careful. Because it could cause problems, maybe in your life, and you've experienced that. Well, I don't know if it's as bad as Joshua 22. That could have been horrible. Somebody stopped it and said, no, 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 no. It's not true. Or let's go together. If you're afraid, I'll go with you to them if, if you can't. But it doesn't belong. What doesn't belong with us doesn't belong with us. And what an encouragement that can be to all of us. Let me end with one more, because uh, I thought it was funny. <laughs> Is this a, it's actually in a poem. I can't believe I'm resorting to a poem. So a woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight, and she hunted in a for a book in the airport shops, and she bought a bag of cookies and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, and, but happened to see that the man sitting beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between them. And so she tried to ignore and kind of avoid making a scene. So she munched the cookies and watched the clock as that gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock she was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, it, if it wasn't so nice, I think I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one. When only one was left, she wondered what was going to happen, and when the smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half and ate the other, and she snatched it from him and thought, Oh, brother, this guy has some nerve, and he's also rude. Why he didn't even show any gratitude? She had never known that she had been so, um, she had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was finally called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at that thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane, sank in her seat when she sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she reached with surprise that was uh, her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. If mine are here, she moaned in despair, the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, and the thief. <laughs> and I thought, what a, what a fun little tale that we don't point at somebody else and say they have a problem with. No, we don't do that. We look back at ourselves and say, you know what? Joshua 22 just shows up in the series right here, right now, as a reminder for us to be careful with what's said, be careful with what we hear, that we handle things the right way. And I think the few points in this uh, lesson may be of a little bit of help to us. So let me pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for our salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. We know that we've sinned and that we are in desperate need of a reunion with you that happens only by faith in what he did for us, so thank you. I pray also, Heavenly Father, that you would help all of us be more free from the distractions of gossip, conversations that don't belong with us and that belong in the right place. So move each of us individually to a right place with this wonderful passage you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.